Actually, I think I'm going to get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be presenting on the disease burden associated with agricultural tillage-related particulate matter 2.5 pollution in the U.S., and also discuss some of the mitigation strategies. So this presentation was prepared by myself, uh, Dr. Felicia Wu from Michigan State University, and Dr. David Hennessy from Iowa State University. So firstly, like, uh, what is particulate matter? Uh, I'm sure you all are familiar with it in some form or the another. Uh, in the news, it's always there. So basically what uh, particulate matter pollution is, is basically dust or like liquid, small liquid droplets, such as dust, uh, soot, smoke, and various chemicals uh, that are in the air. And particulate matter 2.5 are basically those particles which are uh, 2.5 micrometers or smaller. Um, to put that in perspective, uh, this figure shows, this diagram shows like, uh, this is a strand of human hair, and you can see particulate matter 10, which is 10 uh, micrometers, and you can see how small particulate matter 2.5 is. And uh, since they are sm so small, they can pose the greatest public health risk as they can reach deep into the lungs when inhaled. So what are some of the adverse health outcomes associated with PM 2.5? So uh, PM 2.5 is associated with various health issues such as stroke, ischemic heart disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and a host of other diseases. And if we think about the pathway, like when PM is inhaled, it, it causes oxidative stress in the lungs. And this uh, inflammatory mediators will go to the blood vessels and that will cause uh, systemic inflammation in, uh, in places like heart. And, and also like uh, once you inhale PM 2.5, uh, they can translocate into circulation, which cause uh, through the same pathway of systematic oxidative stress and inflammation affect uh, cardiovascular health. So currently PM 2.5 is associated with uh, the, the highest, sorry, um, associated with the greatest proportion of adverse health effects in the US with around 48,835 estimated annual deaths. So what about PM 2.5 from agricultural tillage? So primary PM 2.5 basically in the form of dust is uh, emitted by activities such as agricultural tillage. Uh, what is tillage? Um, as you all may know, tillage is the common farm practice of manually turning the soil. And it's mainly done to control for weeds before planting, uh, incorporate crop residue from the previous plantation season, and also prepare the land in general for planting of new seeds. And uh, tillage causes PM 2.5 pollution as dust is emitted and conventional tillage, which is an intensive form of tillage, uh, causes more uh, emissions than uh, conservation tillage or no tillage practices. So what are the aims of our study? Uh, we aim to estimate the total PM 2.5 emissions from tilling of corn, soybean, wheat, and cotton, which are four of the most major crops in the US in the contiguous United States. So that is 48 states. Then we aim to attribute PM 2.5 pollution from these crops to the health burden in the US. And here health burden is measured via annual deaths and disability adjusted life years, which is DALIS. Uh, we also aim to quantify the estimated health economic loss from death and valleys attributable to uh, tillage-related PM 2.5 pollution. And finally, we recommend some strategies to minimize uh, conventional tillage in favor of better tillage practices, which reduce PM 2.5 pollution. So methods, uh, the data for our study comes from two major sources. So annual death and DALIS uh, uh, data come from the Global Burden of Disease Study, which provides death and DALI for all 48 states. 
And data for crop-related PM2.5 emissions came from EPA's National em Emission Inventory Report of 2017. And we uh, used the EPA wagon wheel tool to uh, estimate em emissions from each of the following crops. So I'm not going to go into uh, the detail of how emissions were calculated. Basically, uh, we had a emissions factor for each tilling type, for each crop, for each county, and that was multiplied by the total uh, agricultural land till for each tilling type, for each crop in each county. And there was a cons uh, conversion factor, and those were uh, summed across to get the emissions from all crops for all tilling types. Uh, how did we attribute mortality or dallies to the crop tillage? So it was done by multiplying the total death from all PM 2.5 times the fraction of death from just the tilling of the crops. So this was like a linear estimation. So what are the key results? Uh, we found that in 2017, 0.25 million tons of PM 2.5 emissions came from the tillage of these four crops, out of which 61% were attributable to the intensive form of tilling, which is conventional tillage. Uh, same, uh, to put that in perspective, tillage of these four crops made up about 5% of the total PM emissions from all sources. So this may uh, sound like a small number, but when you put that in perspective, that's attributable to around 2,229 annual death and 56,735 annual dallies. And the health economic loss associated with that death and dallies is about 22 billion and 5.6 billion dollars respectively. What we also found was if there's, uh, let's say a theoretical shift from conventional tillage to a better tilling practice, conservation tillage, then we can avert around 624 annual deaths with an estimated annual benefit of around 6 billion US dollars. Similarly, a shift to no tillage uh, will lead to aversion of 1360 annual deaths with an estimated annual uh, benefit of around 13.6 billion US dollars. This is just a map which shows where the burden of death uh, is highest. Texas uh, has the largest burden with around about 400 deaths. And these are followed by the Midwestern state, which uh, makes sense because they are the most uh, agriculturally uh, heavy uh, states. So moving on, like, uh, so what are some of the strategies that can be uh, deployed to reduce tillage and consequently PM 2.5 emissions? For instance, a Pigovian subsidy, which accounts for the positive external benefit of reduced tillage can be given for the adoption of conservation tillage or no tillage. And uh, they will consequently re uh, reduce PM 2.5 emissions. Similarly, cover crop plantation uh, is, a, is a crop management method that can be, be used and that basically reduces wind and water cost soil erosion and consequently reduce PM 2.5 emissions. And since tillage is also a major source of greenhouse gas emissions, credits and payments for uh, greenhouse gases captured from conservation tillage is also a way to promote better tilling practices. So previously I talked about La, uh, Picovian subsidy and here I'll try to present a, a, a model, a conceptual framework for an optimal subsidy amount for conservation tillage adoption. So we propose a framework where theta uh, is basically an index for conservation tillage uh, suitability with a certain distribution function. So basically what we are saying is that between zero and uh, one, land can be either allocated to conservation tillage or land can be allocated to conventional tillage. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, we do not factor in no tillage uh, into this model. And we only take into account the health effects, uh, not like other externalities such as better soil health. So uh, the figure shows basically profit for two tillage practices. The red one is for 
the conservation tillage, whereas the blue one is for uh, conventional tillage. So when there is zero subsidy, uh, farmers may choose to uh, uh, plant certain acres under uh, conventional tillage and certain under conservation tillage. Let's say that point is A, where the profit is maximized. But if you give a subsidy to a certain amount, uh, the curve for conservation tillage basically shifts upwards and outwards, and hence the profit, uh, profitable acres under conservation tillage increases to point B. So this will be the expanded land set on, under conservation tillage. So using this conceptual framework, we um, basically have the aggregated profit given by the area under these two curves with the subsidy amount. And in regards to the uh, social welfare aspect, we are only considering the health effects, which is given by NVP, the formula, where N is the affected human population, V is the value of statistical life per tillage pass, and PH is the number of conventional tillage pass, and PL is the number of co conservation tillage pass. Hence, the total welfare would be the aggregated uh, profit from both tilling, minus the subsidy given for the acres of tillage, minus the health effect of both tillage. So there's a complicated uh, calculus, uh, which basically boils down to the fact that the optimal subsidy is given by the formula M times V times pH minus PL. So we calculate such a, we calculated such a subsidy amount for our soybeans in Iowa. And that number came down to 71.8 USD per acre. Now the question would be like, what is the effect of such a subsidy on soybean tillage practices? And we were able to answer that question using Perry et al. study, who calculated the probability of conservation tillage when there's a change in fuel price index. Uh, we, fortunately, we had data for the actual fruit, uh, fuel price for those years, and hence we could express that probability in terms of a change in one US dollar subsidy. So what we found was like, if there is one USD subsidy per acre, then the probability of conservation tillage adoption increases by 7.53%. So theoretically, if such a subsidy of 71.8 USD per acre is given, all soybeans planted under conventional tillage will shift to conservation uh, tillage. Well, I said theoretically, because implementation of such a large amount of subsidy may be a challenge. And this should, this should be further explored. So in conclusion, I would like to say like tillage is mainly a choice dependent on the benefit and cost of each tillage type. And farmers have like the financial motivation to factor in these benefit and cost. For no tillage, the benefit is better soil health for higher inputs, uh, but costs for higher, uh, higher costs for inputs such as fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Whereas uh, intensive tillage involves better weed control, but higher machinery, fuel, and equipment, and labor cost. And reduction in int intensive tillage and adoption of conservation tillage has the incidental benefit of PM2.5 pollution reduction. And also I would like to point out tolerance of weeds to the main herbicide used which is glyphosate is a major issue in no tillage adoption in the recent years. Uh, alternative herbicides such as dicampa may be used for weed control and thus uh, increase no tillage adoption. And um, subsidies may reduce conventional tillage. However, implementation may be a challenge. Finally, some of the limitations are like we couldn't account for factors such as soil moisture, wind conditions when calculating the PM 2.5 emissions because EPA had not used these variables in their calculation. Also, we could not account for the proximity to the PM emission source, uh, as we did not have the data for that. Um, mortality numbers may also be slightly um, biased upward because we have them at state level, whereas the emissions data were available at county level, and those were aggregated at the state level. Uh, finally, uh, also, uh, the estimates for uh, uh, subsidy and the probability is subject to local sensitivity and may not linearize across all of uh, the uh, acres. So with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you so much. Would that be, be presented?
Um, yeah, oh, it's not. I mean, you can hear it, but don't, don't. What are you going to do? Oh. Yeah, please go ahead. Which is the target of the stores, which is you know, kind of a to get to in your review of the literature to draw on these things related to organic. Uh, there might be literature related to this, but uh, for, for our study, I did not look at it. Basically, um, the EPA wagon wheel tool did not disaggregate crops by. Uh, organic or inorganic. So there's there was just a set of crops, let's say soybean and wheat. There were a bunch of different like durum wheat and other kinds of wheat, which I basically aggregated into one, but I'm not sure if they have classifications for organic versus non-organic. And you also have to take into account that uh, EPA mainly did this study to account for PM 2.5. Like that was the main purpose of the study. So I'm sure there's literature on it, but I am not aware of that right now. Well, organic is very small for these crops. Right. right. Any other questions? Yeah. I, I think you mentioned this, but to address, like you just mentioned, is it farmers or not? So you were estimating that it has impact on the reduction. As you mentioned, that it's really not a climate change contributing to this. It might have climate change consequences, but that's not always right. Okay. So, like, are we like kind of over estimating like the health effects? It's something that's not if actually if they're not in the climate change contributing to this. That's a very interesting question, and um, possibly, like my answer would be possibly that this is, yeah, because um, tilling, uh, tilling and like fertilizer, pesticide use, like they all work in conjunction. Yeah, uh, even machineries like fuel, the amount of fuel use. So there were so many different variables. We had to narrow it down so we could just look at the health effects. But I'm sure you're right. And uh, also, I would like to say, like, the numbers for, like, the monetary value of life, like, value of a statistical life, we used numbers from other studies uh, and basically used that in our study. So one, like, uh, one death was valued at around, like, 10 million. So that's why we came up with such a large number for a subsidy. So say if a value is... Uh, value of a life is higher, then there would be um, a subsidy to compensate that would also be higher. So yeah, that's a great, great question. Yes, Annie. Is there any statistical evidence that this is a retarded practice to most of us? I mean, you use the large estimation of the literature and there is no conflict. In your case, you but is there any statistical evidence that even creates the link between the challenge and what challenge is there or any other outcome that could be affected by the technical project? Just from agriculture. Yeah, sure, sure. There, there was a, a very famous paper from Domingo et al. And they looked at um, the effect of air pollution from all of the agricultural activities. And they classified, classified that by individual activities as well as like food groups. So, and they also found like similar results to ours. Here, like we restricted our analysis to just four crops. Uh, and that was very like, uh, because those are the crops that are planted more in the US, but that paper basically looks into depth of what are the effects of secondary particulate matter pollution, such as from chemicals, fertilizers, that sort of thing. So I would say there is like scientific evidence on that. That was just sort of an interesting guideline along the same lines. That was in the guidelines figure that you came up with, right? For um, the, the amount of type of particulate matter that's in, in the air. Did it come from that study that you just referenced? 
Uh, I, I we actually tried to inquire like how they um, calculated it. I think they used the same tool as we did, which is the EPA wagon wheel tool of 2017. And uh, thankfully, uh, thanks to uh, Rich Mason at EPA, I contacted him personally, and he was willing to share that tool with us. That's how we could came up. We came up with like individual number for each crops. So. Uh, the, the Domingo study, I don't know the exact methodology, but I am guessing like it's the same one. Thank you so much. Okay. Right. I think Zoom is still on, so we can get started immediately. Full screen. I'm not used to that keyboard. <laughs> Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my talk is on academic performance, non-occupational pesticide exposure, and we look at the issue in California. This is John Brock with a graduate student of mine, and Richia, who is uh, with Harvard University, and he recently joined the Singaporean government. So, um, as you know, that pesticides are crucial for agriculture activities, as they are crucial to ensure global food security, and there's a lot of pesticides applied globally. Um, if you look into California, right, we see that annually there's an average of about 200 million pounds of active ingredients that are applied to agriculture fields in California. But there's also a growing concern, and let me take off the mask, maybe it's easier to understand me that way, um, regarding the scale and intensity of applications of pesticides in agriculture, both in terms of what are the long-term environmental implications, but also regarding human health implications, particularly for people right, that work actively with, with pesticides, but also for people who live, live in, in, in the surrounding area of agriculture fields. So in this research here, right, we are interested in non-occupational pesticide exposure. That is exposure right, that takes place not in the workplace. So in that sense, if we think about that kind of research, you usually can't conduct a randomized control trial because what these, these kind of analysis there not very ethical in, in many sense. So therefore, right, we, we use here actually a data-driven approach to get an idea of what is the relationship between pesticide exposure and human health implications. So we combine in our study information from the pesticide, pesticide use reporting system that is a system that is used in California with standardized testing results from California as well and control also for some of the air pollution that, that matter where we use data from, from EPA. Um, what we find in our paper is that there is a small but statistically significant effect of um, non-occupational pesticide exposure on the academic performance measured by test score performance, um, which is statistically significant about four months prior to the actual test dates. Um, there's quite an, a large economic literature and epidemiological literature that tries to improve our understanding of the relationship between pesticides and human health. Um, there is uh, a literature right, that looks into the implications on, on the environment, but also a growing interest in, in human health related research. Um, that human health-related research right, looks primarily into mortality and birth outcomes using um, secondary data from, from California. Um, and, and there's also quite an interest actually to link, to link or better understand the implications of pesticide exposure to our other outcomes, such as diabetes um, was shown, cancer rates, obviously that's a big concern, and, and infant birth defects actually. Um, so, and our research here actually relates to that growing literature on environmental economics that tries to measure the link between an exogenous, hopefully, environmental pollutant and, and health outcomes, as well as um, a literature that actually links them to educational outcomes. So we make a use of three main, main, main data sources. First of all, is a pesticide 
use database, which is maintained by the California Pesticide Regulation Boards, and that provides your information on a day-to-day -day basis on the application of pesticides through agriculture on a one-by-one mile level, basically. Um, we focus on our analysis on only agricultural applications, so we take take out all the municipality use applications that are in this, in this application level database and we focus on, on, on pesticides that are actually highly, moderately and slightly toxic. Plus we also write that, that means we exclude basically on all the non-toxic, humanly toxic pesticides. We link that data say to our main output of interest, which are our test scores. In that sense, we have access to um, the STAR database, but it allows you at the school level to see test results for a different um, grade levels from second to 11th grade. And there's a couple of tests that are conducted every year in California um, from language to mathematics to humanities and sciences. And our analysis, we rely on the mean scale score, which accounts wide for these differences in abilities for different school zones and Basically, it's a more representative measure. We also control for um, air pollution, obviously, which is, has been shown to be strongly linked actually to, to educational performance and uh, constructing key uh, localized pollution measures based on EPA data, accounting for PM2 and uh, CO readings. Um, a big challenge right in our analysis is how we link these point sources. Pestle applications are on a one by one mile application level. So how we link these um, to this these point application to the lived environment where people actually live in, in that sense. So what we do, we relate here to the concept of the school attendance boundary, right? Every school has, a, has an area where they draw kids from, and that is what we use here. We got access actually to um, the, the boundaries of every school district or school actually in California from the National Center for Education Statistics, which um, in its most, most um, recent version, which is from 2015, 2016, allows us to aggregate up pesticide application in the community to, to the level of the school boundary zone, which, which is where, where the students are drawn from, basically. Um, for the air pollution, right, we, we, we use the um, 115 stations that are in, in, um, in, in California and link them with the closest neighbor approach. So let me show you on the left hand side, first of all, the school attendance boundaries. What you see here, right, are the school attendance boundaries. Um, rural areas draw from larger areas, urban areas seem to be, be rather small. And on the right hand side, actually, you see the density of pesticide application. It's an average over the last 20 years, basically. Not surprisingly, right in the valley, you see a lot of pesticide application. If you come to the urban areas, yes very little agriculture pesticide applications taking place. And you see also kind of an intensity measure actually here where darker, darker shades, shades indicate actually higher levels of pesticide applications. So um, in our study, we are actually interested in the lead time effect of pesticide applications. So basically what we do, we want to see how academic performance actually varies with different levels of pesticide exposure prior to the actual testing date. Well, test dates, if you ever work with educational data, are a pain, um, particularly in California, right, when um, some schools actually provide very, very reliable information on the test day. There's a rule set in place that's based on the start date of the school year. These tests need to be conducted 85% out of the school year. So what we did actually, we um, resourced all the cal academic calendars of every school in California and constructed that date of when actually the testing took place for the ones we had no information about, which was about 60% of all the schools in, in, in California. So um, we, there's, a, there's actually a large literature that shows that um, small levels of pesticide exposure seem to not really cause any, any health implications, any impacts on, on, on people that are exposed. So for, to account for that, actually, we follow the approach that was uh, developed by Lars and Morg in a, in a recent paper, Nature Communications, which actually defined pesticide exposure or extreme pesticide exposure based on the distribution of pesticide applied within a given year based on the 95 percentile. So basically, right, um, school zone attendances, school, Okay, good to know. For the entire time, or just myself? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's your presentation. Yes, so can we make it for the entire screen? So next time we don't need to, of course. Okay, that's only one speaker. One, that's good. 
Okay, cool. Can I go full screen again? Okay, good. Thank you. So, but we, we stop where we have that issue of load passes of exposure, which tend to be not, not, an, not a problem. That's why we use that approach by Larson and look into areas actually which have high level of pesticide exposure. In, in our final sample, we basically have school level test score data um, for 7,914 schools, 22 different tests that are conducted over 10 grade levels and 11 years of data covered from 2003 to 2014. We had to cut our data after 2014 because by testing standards in California had been changing. So the STAR program had been discontinued in, in that year. But earlier data are not digitalized, actually. The STAR program initially started in 1999. So our baseline model, right, is a, it's a very simple two-way fixed effect regression model where we account for a couple of unobserv observables, actually, which are basically defined at the school level. Right, we have fixed effects that are at the school catchment zone level, test by grade fixed effect, as well as year fixed effect to account for common changes over time as well as we control for a couple of observables, a female student share, share of Hispanic students, share of white students, and share of teachers with a higher, higher educational degree, average year of teaching experience. And basically our identification what comes in that sense from variation in pesticide exposure or pesticide application based on the 95 percentile over space. Our following common practice, right? We, we cluster our standard error at the respective school catchment level. What you see here uh, is a table that summarizes our baseline, baseline results, but right? remember that we actually define our, our treatment relative to the date when a test took place, and we use that to um, define the total passive exposure. This is again, it's a, it's a, to see the header. Okay, yeah, now without header, um, and I can move that one also to the corner a bit. So we compare you to specification. One is a simple dummy specification following the approach by Larson, right, 95 percentile, and the other one is basically taking the log of pesticide exposure for the total amount of pesticides applied within a given school catchment zone. What we find in terms of the log specification, right, there is very limited statistical evidence for significant relationship. Um, all, all the coefficients, some of the coefficients have the expected sign based on literature, but overall there's very limited evidence. When we take that other approach from Larson, which defines the uh, Larson and Noah, which is for, defines the extreme areas, we find some evidence for statistically significant effects, but I don't see them as, as very strong and convincing in many ways. But overall, why we find the test scores are about 0.6 point lower in areas which experienced um, Pe strong pesticide exposure 16 weeks out. And now the slides, okay. So we, we conducted a, a couple of robustness checks and heterogeneity analysis to get a better grip of what is actually going on in our data here. Um, first of all, right, the question is can we break out the data? We had to, uh, originally we, we lumped everything together, but obviously pesticides have a different level of toxicity to, to, to humans and, and the environment as well. So what we did here, right, we actually broke out the, 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 um, the pesticide according to these categories. Um, we also conduct a subsample analysis, uh, analysis um, where we only looked into areas which actually have positive pesticide application. Remember that right, our control group are areas that have no pesticide application, which are basically urban areas and, uh, and suburban areas in California. And we conducted a placebo test where we used pesticide application two to three months out of the date when the actual test took place to see whether there is a significant relationship. Um, the placebo test actually showed no evidence of a statistically significant relationship. So distribution of pesticide ex, uh, exposure, right? Um, most areas, as you see, have a very small exposure overall in terms of pesticides. There are certain areas that show significant larger exposure to pesticides in, in terms of the, uh, the amount applied, but overall, most areas actually show rather low application areas. So first, let's focus in the, uh, at the toxicity level, right? We classified here pesticides into, into four groups from, from highly to moderately as severe, and we actually find for category one, no relationship that is significant, category two, also no relationship, so moderate has no effect on, 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 on school outcomes, category three, which are the 
more severe pesticides actually seems to show actually a relationship. Category four, because there are very few of these are pesticide applied, uh, mostly forbidden to apply these days, um, there's also no relationship. So there's some evidence, actually some support that um, higher doses, such higher applications of um, more harmful pesticide lead to a negative impact on testing scores. So to conclude my presentation, what we find actually um, some evidence for a negative relationship, um, which is 16 weeks out of the day when um, the actual tests took place and that lead to a 0.6 reduction test scores. Um, however, right overall this relationship is could be also spurious based on statistical distribution probabilities. Uh, we have to do a bit of more work to actually get a clear understanding of the relationship. Uh, when it comes to further work that we pl plan to conduct out of that work, we are currently expanding that work to include a, a pesticide dispersion model that takes into account how pesticides actually apply to a fit and then spread into suburban areas. And we are also concerned about why the decay of pesticides. I mean, if you apply pesticides 16 weeks out before the actual test, it could be problematic because the lifetime of that pesticide is maybe just two to three weeks, and then it's, there's no nothing left in the in the environment in that sense. Um, there's also the question about right, in terms of of different dependent variables. Where we took here average test scores, but maybe a, a more cut off variable like proficiency tests could be useful in that sense. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to your questions. Uh, my question would be with regards to the right exposure assessment. So you are uh, measuring the pesticide exposure in the air. Mm. Uh, if you uh, consider like the pesticide exposure in the air applied during testing, So if we think about the agriculture mechanism that we're interested here, right? That's people that live in a suburban or a rural area actually, and are exposed by a tractor that is driving by and spraying the, the pesticide in the in the surrounding area. So that's the mechanism, right? Is is um, exposure to application in a surrounding area basically. But that is also some concerns, right? I mean, um, how much is actually drifting into into the area I live in. Am I all day at that area? You know, we tend to move around. And that's why our initial approach was here. We look into the school catchment zone, which is an aggregate, right? But that's an area where most people spend a lot of their time, especially children. So either in their home or they're at school. So that's why we actually selected that level of aggregation. The other mechanisms that we talked about was the exposure through um, so um, food is an interesting area of research for food science, scientists in particular, but it's nothing we can actually answer with data that is available. There are localized studies, obviously, that look into these things, right? Um, but what we do, right, is that other dimension. I live in an area, I don't want to be exposed, but I am exposed, so what are the implications that we see? Yeah, yeah. Whoever wants to go first, sorry. <laughs> you went at the same time. Um, I may have missed this in the robustness check, but like when you've got a lot of, um, in, you know, you've got a lot of vibrators in your experiment, and it's taking some out, it's you know, moving some out and focusing on a 16 week or a yeah, we, we played a while to get significant estimates with these kinds of approaches. Now, um, we, we, uh, <laughs> but but I, I wanted I wanted to be honest in that presentation of what we actually find, and I, I see I don't see a very strong link. But you're right. I mean, different aggregation levels, right? If you if you if it cuts the distribution differently over time, you might see a stronger push up, and maybe you know there is more statistical evidence for for a significant relation. But that's something. Why that is more data driven than actually informed by the actual relationship, but I would assume. My, my prior was that I see actually applications two weeks out of the of the date of a test having an impact and everything else out shouldn't have any any impact. So that is a surprising result actually that not short-term exposure, but long-term exposure seems to have a stronger or have actually some impact of on, on academic performance, which is opposite to what you usually see in the in the in the air pollution literature. Right, which is mainly concerned about these long, short-term exposure issues. Was it answering your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. It's actually really reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I work at USDA. Yeah. I work at USDA. I work at USDA. I work at USDA. I work at USDA. I work at 
psychologist will say, no, no, you have to be very careful how you say that. The conventional is still safe. So even if it's safe in area. Which is a kind of against where the other results. If you look into this nature communication paper by Lars and Novak from um, UCLA, they found out there's very strong evidence. And that, that, that actually surprised us. And we wanted to dig into that a bit deeper. And what if you, if you go away from the county level analysis, things turn out to be not as straightforward as they are presented in some of the academic research right now. And I think that's our, our contribution here as well to, to reflect on that work a bit more. But my question is actually about the identification because it looks like you might expect many other uh, whatever school boundaries get expected. And then, so you're basically picking up the variation from year to year. Essentially. Yeah, so might we have a 15 years of back data basically where we have different level of passive exposure relative to the date when the test took place, but still you have common shifters, but school performance changes over time. So that's why we need to use these um, school level fixed ethics, but also at the test level, you have that issue, right? That test performance is very in test, uh, test application and, and how tests are. Um, right, well, I, I was more interested in, uh, you might have students that have farmers in my family, so that being said, um, you might be picking up something at a community level where people work, let's say, care less about applying pesticides as well um, within certain communities that are at risk. So mm -hmm. I wonder if that's true. You thought about maybe shops for those communities instead of using this method, where you know, maybe uh, waterfall uh, and then shut off and maybe get pesticides on the yeah. So the baseline identifying assumption that we take here is that a pesticide exposure itself to non-occupational users is exogenous. But if you live in suburbia and, and Davis, you don't know what is applied to your field. Is the field that is, is closest to your house? That's commonly not knowledge of, of people that live live in in suburbia or, or, or rural areas in that sense. So the farmers obviously know what they do, right? But the people that live in an in, in, Suburban neighborhoods that is experienced spread of don't have that knowledge in any sense. So the comment, the chalk that you are talking about, right, is regulation shifts. I mean, you know that regulations in California when it comes to pesticide application have become a lot more stringent. They're not fully applied in some sense, but but it, it had changed a lot over time. So actually, what right, if you think about the the variation changes, there are two sources of variation over time that we're exploring here. One is uh, changes in agricultural practices. Think about the huge ex expansion of almond production in California, about 1.3 million bearing acreage um, this year, and just in over 10 years, basically. So in that sense, right, changes in agriculture practice or production box is one source of variation. The other one is regulation, but we don't explicitly model it in our, in our, in our analysis. We assume it to drive the uh, observed changes in pesticide exposure. Helpful. Okay, we can talk afterward. Okay, thank you. Okay, you need to restart the screen sharing. Do I need to reshare the screen or? Okay. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Min Fang, and uh, I came from Michigan State University. I'm a PhD uh, candidate from the Department of Agriculture, Food, and Resource Economics. And today I'll be presenting an ongoing work of my co authored with several uh, uh, professors from Michigan State University as well as uh, Iowa State University in which in we investigate the impact, the unintended uh, health risk of the genetic modification adoption 
uh, focusing on the health impact of glyphosate use on mortality rates of different types of diseases. So how am I supposed to? Is this not working? Okay. So today my presentation will be outlined as, as follows. I start with introducing the background motivation of my study and then briefly introduce the data we apply and some important results from our uh, descriptive analysis. And then followed by uh, the introduction of the empirical methods and uh, results we got and then conclude. So first, uh, the genetic modification or the genetic engineering is perhaps one of the most important uh, technology adoption in the United States in the past two or three decades. And follow the definition of the USDA, the genetic modification is defined as a production of heritable improvement via either genetic engineering or other traditional methods in which the genetic engineering is just a manipulation of the gene by introducing, eliminating, or rearranging specific genes. However, for some of you that are familiar with the concept, you might notice that in literature, actually some other countries are uh, taking the GM as exactly the same as GE, so that you can see the confusing part. So this is uh, the, the distinguish or the difference between these two is just a definition by the United States for the USDA. So in the past decades, ever since its first commercialization in 1996, uh, the GE crops has uh, gained huge success in the United States. Currently, or by 2019, there are over 90% of corn, soybeans, cotton, sugar beets, and canola in the, in the United States are planted with GE seeds. And it also provides huge uh, yield improvement as well as uh, cost reduction. This is correlated to the, the labor uh, cost and as well as the time cost reduction in those traditional pillaging practices for wheat man uh, management. Even though it again huge success like in uh, providing the, the yield improvement or the cost reduction, the, there are public concern on the health and environmental impacts of these genetic engineered crops. And this is first about its the direct health and environmental impacts of GE crops. For example, the potential uh, in provoking gene transfer from GE crops to human beings, as well as the potential of having the allergic rea reaction to those GE crops. Also the potential migration of genes from GE crops to other species, including the crop itself, as well as weeds. And also there's uh, also huge concern on the reduction in biodiversity, including the about diversity of the crop, weeds, pests. However, compared to all, all these uh, direct health or environmental impacts, which is more ambiguous actually, because you know, like solid studies have found, like it's it's a really big deal. Like it's more straightforward regarding the direct impact of the GE crop adoption on pesticide using pa patterns. So currently, the two most uh, applied commercialized. Uh, uh, G crop uh, traits are herbicide tolerant and BT. So the first one, uh, HT mainly is mainly the glyphosate tolerant or GT uh, traits. This is associated with uh, the expanding use of glyphosate. However, the substitution uh, between the non-glyphosate herbicide and uh, glyphosate uh, results in the reduction use in the non-glyphosate herbicide. However, the second trait of this G crop, which is BT, uh, have the gene, I think it's collected from the, uh, a soil, soil bacteria that produces an insecticide protein, so no uh, insecticides are needed. So this kind of trait is associated with uh, less use of insecticides. So there's, there is like a strong correlation between the using patterns of these three types of uh, pesticides after the GE crops has been widely adopted in, in the United States. And the results of this GE adoption is the rapidly rapidly expanding use of glyphosate in the United States. So, there, uh, so the glyphosate only counts for 4% of herbicide use in 1995 of um, four major crops, so cotton, soybean, uh, wheat, and uh, corn. However, it climbs to 33% in 2005 and 40% uh, in 2012. And there, so the potential health impacts of changing glyphosate using patterns includes uh, the risk of uh, air exposure, as well as uh, the risk of uh, 
get the uh, residue through the water system. It also can enter the food system. This includes the crop residues as well as animals because uh, because of the feed crops that are that that contains the the, the glyphosate residues. And there are huge or well, hidden debates on the health impacts of this glyphosate, actually, especially on cancer. So one example is uh, the different uh, idea from the International Agency uh, for Research on Cancer and the EPA, for example, in 2015, uh, the IRC reclassified the glyphosate as in the as probably carcinogenetic to humans in the 2A category, while like two years later, EPA got an, the conclusion that it's not still not likely to be carcinogenetic to humans based on the review on other uh, bunch of studies. So, so all these uh, studies, they, this kind of assessment relies on, can be categorized into two types. The first is the in uh, vitro or animal studies, which assess like the impacts of glyphosate on those uh, cells or, uh, or organs or different animals and second type. But the first type is, uh, is dominating the, the whole, uh, whole literature, I would say. So the second type, not too much, but uh, it's mainly the ep epidemiological studies with focus on assessing the exposure uh, risk to glyphosate, but focusing more on the farmers instead of uh, the whole uh, overall population. So the challenges in this uh, in current field studies include first, it might take a long time before the health impacts can actually uh, be observed, especially for cancer. So it might be the case that uh, even though a lot of studies conclude that there's no uh, significant health uh, risk of this glyphosate use, it might be possible that it's just uh, not there yet. And the second challenge is that there is uh, not too many studies covered the period after the GE crops and glyphosate are widely adopted after 1996, especially after the uh, 2000, I would say, you know, so uh, my, so this, this might, it's, it's the same as, as, uh, as the first reason that it might be biased as it may not come into effect yet. And the third one is that uh, in a lot of uh, field studies, they do not control the non-glyphosate herbicide as well as insecticides. So this will, uh, I think it's, this is a, uh, Basically, since uh, as, as we introduced before, the, the use of glyphosate is uh, strongly associated with the non-glyphosate herbicide and insecticides, especially after the GE crops are widely adopted. So we, this is what we did like for controlling this, these two other types of uh, pesticides. Also, the health impacts of glyphosate use on the overall population is not investigated in most uh, studies, while most of those are focusing just on farmers. To address all, sorry. so to address all these uh, challenges in literature, uh, we our, our study aims at, aims at investigating whether the the expanding use of glyphosate is associated with observable changes uh, in health risk of the overall population, which is measured by mortality rates of different type of diseases based on data from the United States. And our paper is motivated by several factors. First, it's the importance of accurate, accurately measure the, measuring the health cost of glyphosate use uh, or the GE crop adoption, considering how popular it is in the United States as well as it's getting more popular in globally. And also some uh, other empirical studies failed in addressing this, the association between the glyphosate and other uh, pesticide types. And also in our study, we will apply the IVS mission to address other potential uh, endogenity issues uh, related to the glyphosate use. And we also believe that our uh, results for our study have a valuable implication on current uh, safety standards of glyphosate residues because under the current standard, it's, uh, the application of, of glyphosate is still safe. Why is this is so weird? One minute, coming back. Sorry, this is so weird. I don't. So this is a many uh, the data sets we we use basically so county level data except for the adoption rates of G crops coming from uh, and GFK uh, King Tech and private uh, investigation organization, which is a farm level adoption rate data, but we. Uh, kind of merge that to the county level to 
to calculate the adoption rate of different GE crops. And here are just two important uh, results on the GE adoption rates uh, in the United States. So as we can see that after the, uh, uh, the first commercialization in 1996, the adoption rates of all different types of uh, GE corn, soybean, and cotton climbed to above 80%. Percent in I think after 2012 and now it's almost like over 90 percent. However, it has to be noted that uh, for corn and cotton, it's the case that in recent years there are more uh, gene varieties that uh, with stacked genes of the herbicide tolerant genes as well as the Bt genes. So it's it just shows the association between the glyphosate and the insecticides because more stacked uh, varieties are applied. And if we look at the, the changes in the pesticide use patterns, we can see that, so the, the all, I think this is a, the yellow line represents for the changes in the insecticide use. This is basically associated with the, the, the wide adoption of BT traits. However, it's more complicated for, for the uh, herbicide use. So the changes in herbicide use is mainly driven by two factors. The first is the substitution effect between glyphosate and non-glyphosate after the, glyphosate, the GE, GT uh, traits are uh, adopted more. But and in the meanwhile, since after more glyphosate are applied, like there is a more and more significant impact of the growing glyphosate resilient weeds. So after which the, the use of glyphosate and non-glyphosate increased uh, to a really large extent, especially after recent years. And this is the changes like in the share of non-glyphosate and glyphosate, like in the herbicide market, we can see uh, it, the glyphosate share inclined from 0% to about 40 in like in 2012 and then slightly declined. So the interior model uh, we use is just a simple fixed effect, effect model we, uh, in which uh, the G and I H represents for the, the use of uh, glyphosate and non-glyphosate non uh, herbicide, the insecticide, and uh, other, uh, it's mainly, I think it's fungicide and other uh, pesticides, in which we control the state by year fixed effect and the fixed effects for the county and year. And more importantly, we apply the IV estimation to, as, as to estimate the model and apply the adoption rates of GT corn, BT corn, GT soybean uh, to ensure um, as an instrument variable for the adoption for this the use of these three types of uh, pesticides. So the so the first results uh, empirical results focus more on the three major uh, type of diseases like that cause the most uh, mortality in the United in the United States: the neoplasms, the cardiovascular diseases, and chronic respiratory diseases. We find that the the average glyphosate use in the past five years is significantly associated with now uh, mortality rates of neoplasms, cardiovascular diseases, as well as uh, chronic respiratory diseases. However, on um, female, it's only uh, significantly associated with the female mortality rates of cardiovascular diseases. It's more significant on um, male than female. And we also investigate the, the impact of glyphosate use on different types of cancer. We also find a similar thing that the glyphosate use is positively associated with male mortality rates of several types of cancer, but not uh, on, uh, on female. I, I think like last presenter also found similar results that it's more, it's significant on, on uh, male students, but on, on boys, but not on girls, I guess. There are some link between the results so basically our conclusion is that first the genetic engineering crop adoption uh, increased the use of uh, glyphosate, but uh, decreased the use of non-glyphosate herbicide and is associated with the decreasing use of insecticides as a result from our first stage IV estimation. And also regarding the health impact of glyphosate, we found that male mortality rates of neoplasms, different types of cancer, cardiovascular diseases, as well as chronic respiratory diseases is strong, is significantly associated with, associated with uh, glyphosate use. And the female mortality rates of cardiovascular disease is also uh, associated with the glyphosate use. And there might be uh, several potential me mechanisms that can explain this you know, gender difference. This can be the, perhaps the difference in, in, in exposure in, in, in spraying or application of glyphosate, for example, the, uh, 
the, the male might take more of this kind of agricultural work or long uh, maintenance work. This can also be the behavioral difference, such as smoking, drinking, outdoor activities, as well as the difference in basic health risk, perhaps. And these two implications of our study includes first, uh, there might uh, more studies might be needed to correctly measure the health impacts of livestock use as well. We might need to rediscuss the current safety standards of this glyphosate. And just the last statement is that this is still an ongoing study. I think we are, our country might be very uh, controversial. So the confidentiality of our results are not guaranteed before further review. Yeah, I think that's all for today. Thank you. Any questions? Or... So you, you, you're saying I'm, I'm... Yeah, that's like the actual use, actual use of, yeah. Yeah, that's why we're yeah, applying the, like the use in past five years. It's not like, uh, so that, so all like, uh, yeah. In the selection of the five years, yeah, exactly. yeah I, I think yeah one yeah one. So we we have like a a, a co-author like from the epidemiology like uh, from his like suggestion. So first, uh, like the pesticide use or glyphosate use can like affect the the incidence of getting certain diseases. And at the same time, for those who already get the, those cancer or diseases, like if the glyphosate use is affecting like the function of their organs, it's also possible that it can increase the possibility for them like developing from the disease to, to, to death. So we, I think I, we run some robustness check, like changing the period from five to 10, but like uh, he feels like it's a pope. So it's like in epidemiology, uh, uh, so in, in that area, it's, it's like an appropriate range for assessing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that's 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 definitely what we we're planning to do. Cause like the outdoor activity, I think we we have inspired by the the conclusion from like last presenter. Cause I don't think that the 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 girls and boys like in in school like are different in terms of you know operating those those gloves or pesticides. So I I think that's a possibility. But regarding like. Yeah, I think that's definitely a thing we can do in future as like we haven't actually uh, find enough literature supporting, you know, that our conclusion yet because we are kind of conscious about we, we need to figure like make the, the result assessment right first before we find like those supporting, you know, evidence of like how might this affect female and male differently like in those scientific studies, I guess. Yeah, but good suggestion. Thank you so much. Yes. I guess since they're only looking five years back, and I'm sure you're not taking all of this on the same year stuff that you were just talking about the cancer, but you're finding more of a rapid reform. But, you know, they develop more faster, I mean. In the mortality rates of this cancer? This yeah. cancer? Well, so I. I it, it, are, well, first off, they come in the. They have a fairly high mortality rate, they have a mortality rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a really good point. So first, regarding like the general trends of this cancer mortality for most type of cancers, it's like declining over time because of the better healthcare of the early detection program or treatments. But there are types of like I think one or two type of cancers that's like still inclining over time. And the second, it's definitely true that we will be comparing like those co like the size of the coefficients we got for different cancers and then find like the, the evidence supporting our conclusion for sure. Yeah. Yes. What motivates the choice for the long term model and mortality? Like it's a double double normalization. You mean the mortality rates? Yeah, mortality rate is already a normalization that's adjusted by population and then we pull a lot on top of it. And yeah. I wonder what motivates that choice because that's a bit uncommon to get the survival. Yeah, I think it's mainly because the absolute number, like the variation in absolute number is not that significant in, in a way. But we, I'm not sure whether it's consistent with, I think we use that, but maybe not that so significant perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, so I'll go ahead and start. i um, gonna shift us a little bit into livestock and uh, livestock quarantines and their impacts on human and animals, uh, specifically at the Uganda-Tanzania border. Um, and then when we're talking about livestock quarantines today, uh, we're going to be talking about, let's see if I can get this to move, uh, foot and mouth disease, uh, which is a highly contagious and economically damaging infectious disease in livestock and is one of the main reasons why quarantines are going to be happening in this area. Um, when infected animals, um, primarily, it affects primarily uh, cattle, sheep, and goats. So those are going to be your main um, production animals and uh, main sources of income. And then uh, FMD, it, animals infected develop painful lesions. They see reductions in milk, uh, inability to be used in the field, and their value ultimately decreases from weight loss um, and overall sickness. And so a lot of times too, we see uh, abortions and death in young animals, but um, um, it's typically characterized by high morbid morbidity and low mortality. Um, one of the challenges though with FMD and why um, we, there's going to be livestock quarantines and, and, and restrictions on movements instead of other control approaches uh, is because it's unpredictable. Um, it's, I used to compare it to uh, influenza, but now I think um, discussing it more in terms of coronavirus can help everybody relate a little bit better, that there's multiple virus serotypes and strains circulating uh, in East Africa alone for the seven serotypes are there, um, as well as then constantly evolving strains. Um, on top of that, just the, the way that animals are raised and the constant interaction um, for grazing, moving um, upwards of hundreds of kilometers to go to grazing and water, there's a lot of interactions and it makes it challenging to um, implement any, any type of control measures. Importantly though too, that there's limited quality of vaccines, both in the ability to match the vaccines to the circulating serotypes, as well as then the availability of vaccines. And so livestock quarantines are one of the primary approaches um, and specifically to FMD. There is significant variation though across and within countries, uh, both on the duration and coverage. 
Um, for the most part in Uganda, there's uh, formal enforcement. Um, this, the formal enforcement is supposed to be um, come alongside vaccination points, um, but often there's not enough vaccines. There's um, additionally control points to um, stop animals from moving in and out of the quarantine zones, as well as um, uh, stop movements of animal products. In contrast, in Tanzania, which is right there on the border and that where we're looking, um, despite kind of these open borders and fluid movement between uh, the two countries, both formally and informally, um, any type of enforcement of movements or closing of uh, livestock markets is going to be done locally um, and um, somewhat informally. And so here there's just two uh, um, newspaper clippings within the past year about some of um, the press that goes around the quarantines. Um, this one here explains that it's a two-year animal quarantine that was just lifted. This is not uncommon to see this duration, as well as then for um, joint action at the, at the border, um, just because they are so interconnected. And so a lot of the work that's been done looking at uh, livestock movements and, and these impacts are on, um, have been done with simulation studies that have a fairly good understanding of how FND circulates, how, what the risk is like for households um, and farmers and markets and, and larger commercial sectors um, because it's not endemic in, in, in a lot of the developed countries. Where we're challenged in East Africa is, is not having information on that risk. Um, there's a lot less empirical evidence as to what these quarantines actually look like and their impacts. Um, some of the more recent um, information has shown and, and, and supported what we see in the simulation studies that both those who are in the quarantine zone and have herds that were infected and those who are not, um, face foregone sales of their animals. They can't sell them at the market because the markets are closed. And then there's reduced availability of food types within the quarantine zone. Um, particularly with FMB, we're talking about milk. Um, some of the gaps and challenges that remain though and that we're hoping to progress towards is disease shocks of similar impacts on households. So the disease itself can have implications on income, wealth, and consumption, as well as the quarantines themselves. Um, if we've learned anything from COVID-19, that policy response um, and, and how that response is carried out can alter the magnitude of the shock as well as the resulting behavior. And then quarantine restrictions rarely match the level of disease risk or impacts. So having a better idea of what those actually are might help us better apply the restrictions. To summarize that a bit more into what we're going to start to look at today is we have this survey data that followed um, FMD outbreaks at the Uganda-Tanzania border. So it was a household survey that was applied um, in conjunction with field work looking at FMD outbreaks and collecting data on the actual virus circulation to evaluate the relationship between infection within the household or the herds, quarantine restrictions, and uh, livestock sales and consumption. And so we're gonna look at, we're trying to look at both the impact of quarantine zones and FMD on um, household sales and consumption, as well as the role of quarantine zones and how their different restrictions um, might be related to these outcomes. And overall, this, we, we hope to provide evidence on the role of livestock disease in response to the disease burden, how this may contribute to the disease itself, and, and to get a better idea of how households are responding. So the household survey, um, this, this study um, very much was inspired by, by a previous study that was looking at outbreak data and uh, collecting predominantly on the outbreak. Um, and it looked at FMB infection within the household and within the area in the last 12 months. Um, we then had households recall data on before the FMB outbreak as well as after, um, removed somewhat from the outbreak on their um, income levels, uh, some of their 
different practices as well as uh, changes in the market prices and activities in the area, um, which we then corroborated with uh, data on uh, market prices. For FMV infection now in this study, we're just going to be using whether the household reports that their herd were impacted or not, um, quarantines, whether they were in the quarantine zone or not, and then um, households reported on how the quarantines affected them, whether it was through sales of livestock or livestock products or movements of human or animals. And then the outcomes are also reported by households um, from the, with time period before and after on sales and product sales, uh, their milk consumption and beef consumption. Analytically at this point, um, we are not doing anything crazy, though I am sure all of you will be able to provide some great <laughs> advice on, on where we can go with this. Um, at this point, we really have just been trying to uh, do some basic look at the impact of quarantines on the change in household production consumption, given that we have that uh, two period time and, and the different groups, um, some very just basic difference and difference estimations and looking at different clustering options of the errors. And then as the robustness checks, looking into as well a change in difference models um, for the sales data using the log models and doing the uh, difference of the logs. So the difference from after and before. And then with the um, trying to better understand the quarantine restrictions, we just look at the relationship between quarantine zone and how um, households are reporting restrictions, given that even if they're not in a zone with restrictions, they are still suggesting that there are um, spillovers to their activities. Uh, looking just at the very basic summary statistics there, we do see that there are significant differences between quarantines and no quarantine zones, um, which is going to be problematic as we're proceeding forward to look at the differences. Um, and these are across our variables of interest um, and that the households in the quarantine zones appear to be selling more livestock and uh, consuming more milk. Uh, but producing or consuming less beef. They also tend to do report more FMD infections. However, we do show that uh, FMD was present in all the areas that we're looking at. Um, so more households might have reported it, but it was actually consistent across the regions. And just the initial analysis, um, there's potentially some, some effects with milk consumption and beef consumption, though these are likely um, biased upwards and that the magnitudes here are um, quite large for milk consumption, beef consumption, being nearly half of what they uh, consume on average. Uh, with the change in difference models, uh, it somewhat holds up with milk consumption the results. Um, from the quarantine zone um, with slightly smaller magnitude. If we look at types of restrictions, um, the, whether households felt any of these restrictions were important or existent in their um, activities across quarantine and no quarantine zones, um, households unsurprisingly said li reported livestock sales as being very important, 68% uh, of them. Um, but there was variation across these different um, questions and it's less well-defined by being in a quarantine zone versus not being in a quarantine zone. However, when we control for our household variables and, and, and the country and FMD, status, then um, quarantine zones are associated with human movements, livestock sales, and livestock product sales, um, but not as strongly with general livestock movements. And so to summarize um, where we are at, at this point is that there, it appears that quarantine restrictions contribute to reduce consumption during disease outbreaks, um, or that there is something going on between those, as we've seen with the direct quarantine impact on milk and beef consumption, 
Um, this would align with reported impacts on the, on the product sales and general human movements um, that we saw when we looked a little bit more into what households were reporting were impacts on quarantine of quarantines. Um, this is, may likely be driven by milk sellers who consume and sell milk and the buyers versus those who are just uh, producing milk purely for their own household consumption. Um, however, moving forward, we'd like to work on better connecting the type of quarantine restrictions with disease incidents and household outcomes um, and look at how to uh, strengthen some of these results and, and their robustness. Um, so far as some of the sample size and data collection uh, being using this as, as kind of a supplementary study to an existing study has limited our, our evaluation of being able to pull out the FMD by quarantine impact or um, country. And so with that, I will uh, thank you all for, for sitting through the session as well as this last presentation. Um, especially big thanks to my co-author Susan, who um, has been who was the one who collected all the data and was doing the field work and, and kind of heading all this. So thank you. Yes. Okay. Yep, that's good to hear. Thank you. Yes. Could you comment on what is the main source of like is there a source? What are the main consumers? Um what the the meat that they're consuming? Um, the source of the source of the main source of data is like the main source of yeah, so the main source of meat tends to also be the main source of milk being cattle, but you're right that there are, there is some goat consumption as well, or some goat milk consumption as well. Um, I don't know, I will have to check on how common this is in the region. Yes. 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 I do, yes. That's actually, um, yeah, I was thinking about matching as well. Um, so looking at these are the distributions of the uh, raw, score, raw outcomes. Um, and so thinking about the, the matching, we do have actually, I mean, it's a small sample size still, but we do have overlap. Um, um, yes. Yes, yes, the household. So how many units? Um, um, yep, it's at the district level, yeah. So we have um, 253 households, and then we have um, quarantines across um, three of five zones. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do you see a lot of substitution of other 
No, um, we didn't because we do have information too on um, consumption of other products and I'm not seeing the substitution, but that would be good to show and the change in prices as well. Yes. Yeah, um, we actually, so they're treated as very large shocks, but because it's endemic, um, we're not, there are definitely production losses at the household, so it's not to diminish those losses, um, but we're seeing outbreaks one to three times a year, so the shock is not, it's, it's very much um, something I guess I, it's, it's not uncommon or. It's just the pandemic, so why does it count? Right. Why does it count? Why does it count? Why does it count? Why does it count? Why does it Because there's so many productivity losses to it um, that, it, but it is, that it's endemic and that it's hap we're seeing multiple outbreaks a year. Um, and so there's still an attempt to control it. And there are these quarantines that can last up to two years, but then that's the argument of why are we doing these when are we achieving anything? And how much are we actually um, benefiting from the quarantines? Yeah. Um, otherwise, if there's no more questions, we are, yes. I think following up on Yeah, and that, that's a good question. I, 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 I'd have to explore more other data sets to see if the stunting and growth is in there because we, we didn't actually collect on that, but that um, we aren't seeing, at least with beans, it was reported that there would be substitution to beans, um, but that's not, it's not clear that, that, that there's a strong substitution to beans. Um, I think though, yes, it could be looked at more in depth about a substitution to other products because we do have a whole host of, uh, of the, proteins. The um, it's gonna be a combination of um, flour and then cassava. Um, there's also... Is, is that something that's also grown by the household? Yes. Okay. So, maybe that would be the person that you might support rather than another person support? Yes. Yeah, I think that would, that would align with what we're hearing in the field. Um, and so showing that would be would be nice to strengthen to show that that substitution is happening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you all again for sitting in this session and um, good job to everybody.